Hi everyone, welcome to this week where we'll look at the, the history of, of international law. Uh, this is my, I think this might be the longest piece that we read by Neff. Uh, the longest piece that we read, it's by Neff. So I have, uh, I've read over it again, this must be my, well, I say it, my second time this semester. Uh, and it is quite long, very dense, uh, very good history. And, and, and it's the history of an idea here, like what Neff's doing, he, he's charting the uh, course of international law, you know, where does it come from and where are we today with the United Nations? But, but you know, the focus is how did we get from the one state of affairs to the current state of affairs, right? And what, what sort of morph, morphing that changes, you know, did one idea of international law uh, move into another idea of international law? And so uh, very useful piece, uh, very dense, like I said, and, and, and something where uh, really reading a, a number of times to, to, to really get uh, everything in there that's everything out of there that's in there I suppose so uh, I want to start by addressing one of the questions which is this it says does international law have any real power if states can just refuse to adhere to it um, I uh, we're gonna deal with that next week is my quick answer to that uh, that that's a really good question for, for next week uh, one that we'll sort of probably spend most of our time thinking about and reading about. Um, uh, the answer, the, the sort of teasing answer is uh, yes, and we'll, 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 we'll look at the very real power that it has, even in the cases where uh, states refuse to adhere to it. Uh, but, uh, but more what we'll do here is sort of look at international law as a concept, um, try and, uh, and sort of find its roots, try and find its uh, sort of chart, its... its um, Chart its course. I'm going to start at the top here, but can international law refer to more than about international relations? If there's no world government, then how can international law even be an actual thing? And that's, that's quite a sort of a fundamental question in international relations. Uh, and so uh, thank you for asking it. I think. Uh, here we find the assumption, and it's a strong assumption throughout, uh, especially realist international relations, right? That law comes from government. That if there's no international government, there can't be any international law because law comes from government. And, and certainly when we look at Hobbes, which and Hobbes is mentioned in, in here, uh, and his contribution to international law, this is sort of what Hobbes is claiming, right? Hobbes is claiming that, you know, outside of government, outside of a social structure, there's no law. There's, and we, when we covered that earlier on in the class when we talked about realism, there's anarchy. Right? Anarchy is the lack of government, and, and anarchy uh, to, to Hobbes means lack of government, but, but lack of law. And actually, that's not quite accurate, Neff says. Neff says that's not quite right. Hobbes does have a couple of things. Um, that are left over from natural law when he's pared it down. He's really cut out whole swathes in order to have, in order to sort of invent his state of nature, in order to, 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 to build a state of nature, he's really had to get rid of natural law. In, in a way that, uh, remember, oh, maybe this was a different class, sorry. But in a way that Locke doesn't, right? Uh, and that was a different class. But, but Hobbes does, and that's why Hobbes is so important to realism, because he strips away so much in, of, of the natural law, and Neff says all that's left of it is two elements. One is self-preservation, right? We can never give up that right uh, of self-preservation. Uh, this is on page 157. I just fortuitously, uh, as I was fiddling about with the book, uh, my eye popped onto it. So here it is. Uh, it's, on, it's on page 157. It's on the, the, the second column on that page about halfway down, a little bit past halfway. Uh, and it says this, uh, and, and we're talking about Hobbes. Uh, and it says, natural law was not rejected in its entirety, but it was radically stripped down to the point of being reduced in essence to two fundamental tenets, a right of self-preservation and a duty to perform contracts or promises. So uh, this is the beginning. This is, the, this is a great question to begin with because here we are now, uh, we're sort of agreeing with Hobbes. How can there be international law? Law comes from government. Uh, our security, uh, the, the, the ability to enforce law comes from, from, from government. Uh, 
and, and I started this by saying in international relations, there is this assumption, right? And the assumption is oftentimes this, uh, that inside of the nation state, inside of the boundaries, inside of the borders is peace. And, and peace exists there because law exists there. And authority and sovereignty exists there. So inside each of the states exists peace because of because exists law and justice. Hobbes says, you know, without, without government, there is no justice. There's nothing. In the state of nature, there's no justice or injustice. Everything's just whatever you can do. <coughs> <coughs> but outside of the state, between states, for realists and for Hobbes, all exists is war. Uh, there, there is no law. Because nobody, uh, nobody, uh, there's no sovereign, about, and which is what you're saying here. So it's a great question. I hope that uh, as we go through, we'll, we'll, we'll answer that question, actually. Uh, and one of the places that we'll start in terms of answering this is natural law. Neff starts with natural law. He has, um, well, he gets actually into, in, into Da' al-Islam and Da' al Har. Uh, the House of War versus the House of uh, Islam, which is, um, he sort of puts in the context of agreements between, um, agree, well, he, it's in the historical context of agreements between like Italy, uh, Italian states and, 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 and the Muslim uh, world. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's again this distinction, right, between uh, inside and outside, right? The, the, Inside here is, is the House of Islam. Inside of the empire, we're following Islam. Uh, we have the same laws and we have justice here. Outside of, of that is, is a house of war. Now, uh, the Islamic empire is noted because of its, 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 it's a vast area, right? It's one of the earlier uh, vast areas of, of what can be called international law. It's an empire, of a multinational empire. Uh, it's a multinational empire that is um, ruled by common laws. Uh, uh, and Neff likens this to uh, maybe ancient Greek city-states, which is sort of way where he sort of jumps off from ultimately. Uh, ancient Greek city-states where, yes, each city-state is independent, right? They're not, they're not covered by the same uh, nation-state, right? There's no such thing really as the nation-state at that point. But nevertheless, they have a, a set of rules and guidelines that they, that they abide by. Um, in dealing with one another, same with, and later on Italian city states do the same. Uh, also, he mentions uh, communities in the Indus uh, Valley, I think, in, in, in India, anciently, and also in Mesopotamia. Uh, uh, and so uh, it talks about those are small ones, but then we get a big one with, uh, with the Islamic Empire later on. <clears throat> so, the, this, I, I suppose, is still an answering that if there's no world government, right? Hey, if there's no Italian government, which of course there is now, but there wasn't, um, you know, 200 years ago. 200 years ago? Yeah, there wasn't 200 years ago an Italian government. Uh, so, you know, Greece, right? Same, same, same sort of thing, right? Uh, in the Greek city-states, if there's no Greek-wide government, how can there be law? Well, there was law, right? Uh, there was agreements on how to deal with, with, with one another. Uh, I think that, but, but eventually we get to this idea of natural law that comes from Greece, it comes from the writings of Aristotle, it comes through the Stoics, uh, through Cicero who's writing, and it comes to, where does it come to? It comes to the Roman Empire, which again is another example of a, a multinational empire that really does have, uh, at this point, right, we do have a, a central government here. But, uh, you know, the Roman Empire... When we talk about the Roman Empire, it's a multinational empire. There's many nations existing within it, and there's one overarching law. And you say, well, that's that's different. Maybe, maybe you would say that's different because there is a single sovereign, right? The emperor. The emperor is ruling over them all, and he is enforcing the law, um, which is you know, sort of a world government, right? Even if it doesn't extend to the whole world, but it's an international government, a multinational government, not a multinational international. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> but there's this thing called this idea called natural law, right? That comes uh, from from the Greek philosophers to the Romans, uh, to the Church, and to the Roman Empire. And this is another 
This is another sort of idea of how can there be uh, law without government? Because the idea of natural law sort of goes along with what we think of now as a science, right? That there's some sort of, uh, there's some sort of rules, right? Some sort of scientific rules that are governing the universe. Right? Similarly, I mean, that's, that's almost exactly the same concept, right? Uh, and it comes from the same place, probably. It absolutely comes from the same place. So we have this idea of, of natural law that just exists. It's just there. It's not that somebody made it up. It's not that a government made it up. Right? This is the thing that Hobbes is pairing back. Natural law, actually, it's quite, uh, it's quite extensive. It covers all sorts of relations between human beings, uh, between states, between rulers of states. It covers relations with, anim with the animal kingdom. It, it, it also encompasses relations within the animal kingdom, right? within the natural world. Natural law is uh, the most universal uh, law. And it, and it comes from, uh, it, it just is, it's out there. Uh, and the way that we can discern it, uh, he talks about Thomas Aquinas. I'm just having to sort of put my eye on everything that I'm talking about. But uh, page 156, the first uh, part of the first column, I'm seeing it, the sort of the first full paragraph, right, where it starts the European Middle Ages. Down there, it mentions Thomas Aquinas. He says, was you know, the dominant tradition in that, in, it says, the dominant tradition, this is the European Middle Ages, uh, represented outstandingly by Thomas Aquinas was rationalist in outlook, holding the content of natural law to be susceptible to discovery and application by means of human reason rather than of revelation. So uh, the idea then of natural law in the Middle Ages is that there is this law out there, this law that governs the whole universe and all the interactions that occur within it. And we can find it out. Uh, we can discover it. And so people did try and discover it, and they, they, they went about discovering uh, this natural law and elements of the natural law. And, and remember, there was the, uh, the, the uh, use uh, gentium, right, which is the human component of the natural law. Right? It's, it's not really separate. It's, a, it's sort of a sub, subsection of laws right, that govern human beings right, in our interactions with one another. Uh, and we can discover what those laws are. Uh, we can discover what's right and what's wrong because it's, it's, it's fixed uh, in international, sorry, not in international law, in natural law. Uh, it's fixed and it's, uh, it's permanent and, and, and enduring. And so we'll just have to figure out what it is. And, 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 and again, we're writing it down, we're figuring it out and we're writing it down. Uh, um, it, as I said, in exactly the same way that, that scientists might go about finding uh, again, what we might think of as sort of scientific law or something like the laws of physics or something, laws of biology. Um, so we can just we can just discover that, and so that's how it can exist outside of a government, right? That's how it can exist outside of laws because uh, the, the 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 outlook, the belief, the 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 understanding of law uh, during the Middle Ages is that you know it exists um, externally from human beings. It exists beyond our what we've decided beyond what we make up so we're not just making up the law here uh, that doesn't come along that idea doesn't come along until we get to the positivism right uh, positivism which is more sort of a 19th century much heavily much more heavily 19th century sort of post enlightenment um idea but 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 that Law isn't, it's not something that's out there that we are going to discover. It's something that we're going to make up. And there doesn't exist a law unless we've made it up. Uh, and in international law, uh, sort of idea within positivism is that, that, that states, right? And this is uh, page 159, uh, the first column about halfway down. States themselves uh, will make up the law. Which is interesting. Again, going back, I'm only really still answering that first question. It was so good uh, and so evocative, right? But if we, uh, you know, if we go back to sort of states being the, being the originators of law uh, with Hobbes, right? So, you know, Hobbes has pared down the natural law to two things, right? You've got to preserve yourself. You have the, 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 the laws that you preserve yourself and also that you obey any contracts and agreements that you've got into. Right, and so you can see now how that might move things towards this idea of well, what sort of contracts have states entered into, 
uh, right? When states are entering into contracts and agreements with each other's treaties, uh, we'll call them, then um, they're, they're governed by natural law and the natural law is telling them, even for Hobbes, right, it's telling them you have to abide by those agreements that you've made. So, that, so at this point, right, with Hobbes, we're still having states underneath of a law, uh, underneath natural law that governs the whole universe. And, and, and one element, one small element of that natural law is that you have to abide by your agreements. And so now you have states making agreements and by and are bound by natural law to uh, perform the agreements that they make. So uh, we're still now with positivism, we've, we've, this is a hard break from that. Because now we're saying that international law, and I'm quoting here, I'm reading it from the book, International law was fundamentally an, out, an outgrowth or feature of the will of the states of the world. Do you see there's a big difference now? Instead of having a, a law that's not subject to anything, that governs everything, that's not subject to the will of anybody or anything, any corporation, any state. Now, with positivism, we move to an area where states are making up the law. What they think is the right thing to do, what a state wants, that's, that's what the law is. So that, that's a big that's, a, that's maybe the biggest uh, division, the biggest sort of step I want you to see here, this movement from a natural law to a positivist uh, sort of view of, of, of law. Uh, I'm going to go on, I think, because this is what I'm taking from. Rules of law were created by the states themselves, by consent. So again, we have, uh, like, the, you know, the assumption that the question is making, right? If there's no world government, then how can international law e even be an actual thing? Um, Um, this is a positivist uh, mindset, sort of, but it misses, it misses an element, right? And the, the thing that it misses is that states themselves can make laws, right? So there's no, there's no uh, overarching international government, right? There's no world government. But there is, uh, there are states, right? And there are states that are making laws um, and that are, uh, attempting to bind other states to those laws as well. Maybe, you know, you can see it in two ways, right? One where there's sort of agreements are being made between states, right? Um, and, and maybe we don't uh, anymore see it as a natural law obligation to fulfill those agreements. Uh, but we do see it in sort of, but if we don't see it as a natural law, we see it as sort of a, a law of convention, right? like a, well, which is maybe part of natural law, but, but maybe we see it as, as maybe even a, in a positivist terms, right, that states, uh, will and believe and decide that, you know, we should honor our agreements that we make with, with each other, right? And so that positivist uh, law, uh, idea of law, still, still makes states hold firm to, uh, require states to hold to their agreements. Now, um, We're getting ahead of ourselves to the next week, but there was that question there this week. It, it might well be the states still uh, don't keep all their agreements, right? That they can break the law. But note, even in, in even in society, uh, and I'm getting, I'm getting into next week. But even in society, uh, you and I, right? We can break the law. There exists a law, uh, and 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 there exists punishments, and there exists all those things. And it's possible that we, we break the law, and it's possible that we get punished if we break the law. It's also possible that we get off. Um, with breaking the law and that we don't get punished for it. That's, that's also possible and also happens. And so uh, even within a state, even within a nation state, that happens. So, and that's for various reasons. Sometimes, uh, you know, depending on the nation state uh, that we're talking about, depending on the state that we're talking about, um, sometimes uh, people get away with breaking the law because they're, they're rich and powerful. Uh, sometimes just because they, they're lucky or they, they, they're under the radar or they just didn't leave enough evidence, right? Uh, so, so. So that, that's also possible. But again, I've gone a little bit too far into next week where we'll discuss that in much more um, detail. Uh, so quite a lot. I want to look at some of the other, the other questions and see where we are in regards to them. Um, if there's no world government, that's, that was the first one. Most of the laws are created in the West. Uh -huh. Is it appropriate to call laws that were created under one particular part of the world international laws? That's also a very nice question. I, I won't spend as long as I think we've already laid the the, the groundwork for it, but I will refer to sort of natural law in this. I'll say, look, uh, if we 
uh, one, two, right? And, and we are taking a historical view of international law. If we want to point ourselves back to, to natural law, then we say, look, um, uh, and this is picking, uh, picking with the, the created, picking on the, the created in the, in the question there. Yeah. Laws that were created. Uh, if those laws weren't created by states, right? If they weren't created in one particular part of the world, if, they, if it's natural law that exists outside of our will, the will of human beings, uh, then, uh, then that's one way around it, right? So just refer to natural law. Uh, especially if you think, uh, if you've sort of missed positivism and you, you sort of think that natural law carries on with, under Hobbes, right? As sort of the, the reason why we keep our, our agreements or something like that. Or if you think that, you know, law is just discovery, and this is not, this is absolutely uh, something that some people will, will still adhere to, right? That, uh, you know, when, when we make laws in, in states, what we're doing is not, we're not creating laws, but we are just finding laws that, that are already there. Right? Finding laws that are out there in the natural, in natural law. We're just discovering laws and writing them down, right? Uh, so this is one way of, 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 of getting out of that, that question. Um, you know, the other way is, uh, and this is fairly brief, right? But uh, at, uh, fairly brief from Neff, I mean, because at the beginning he talks about, look, uh, it exists in Greece, uh, which, okay, maybe Greece is the West, uh, but it exists in the uh, Islamic world, right? Uh, as, as sort of international law in the Islamic world. And, and it grew out of agreements between both the West and the Islamic world, right? Uh, we're still fairly narrow now, we're just around the Mediterranean in the Eastern Hemisphere. Uh, it talks about the conquest of, uh, the, of South America, right, by the, by the, uh, the Spanish, uh, and I suppose the Portuguese, or I think it just mentioned Spain. Um, that, you know, um, there was some sort of a, a law, a natural law argument about why that was justified, right, uh, in... Uh, uh, Francisco de Vitoria, this is 156 on the second paragraph, almost to the sort of the last third of that column. Uh, the, the Dominican scholar, uh, this is the Dominican scholar Francisco de Vitoria, in a series of lectures at the University of Salamanca, concluded that the Spanish conquest was justified on the grounds, on the ground that the Indians had unlawfully attempted to exclude Spanish traders from their kingdoms, contrary to natural law rules. So, um, that definitely seems that the natural law there is quite, um, quite coincidentally uh, favoring the uh, Spanish, in a Spanish university uh, by a Spanish scholar, uh, a, a powerful country, right? So um, th there's definitely that element to it, right? There's definitely that element uh, to it, which, uh, you know, it makes that a good, a good question. But again, international, uh, the other the other thing that I think about this actually is if you think of you know states where the states start right power, strong powerful states na nation especially if you talk about international laws laws between nations um, then we haven't Neff doesn't do this but we could do this we could sort of say look where do nations start well nations start in France France is the first nation the idea of the nation begins in the French uh, after the French Revolution. Uh, and spreads throughout Europe and gets established in Europe before it gets exported elsewhere. Uh, and so therefore, uh, of course, uh, that's where, and this will sort of back up the question here, right? Of course, this is the, the West, in particular Europe, right? It's where international law has to come from because that's where nations come from. So that's, that's another way to answer the question sort of in, in, in agreement with, I think, the, 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 at least the tacit uh, assumptions that are made in the question. Um, you know, but of course there, there is in the United Nations, which Neff also talks about, there, there is an attempt. Right? There's absolutely a, 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 an attempt to address this. Right? The Security Council, which is the most powerful body by far, uh, it rules over the use of force, which we, we, we learn of in Neff. Uh, it, it bans, the, you know, the United Nations bans the use of force, um, <clears throat> except in self-defense. And, and then it's the United Nations Security Council de decides when and where the use of force can happen. And if you look at the makeup of the, uh, the Security Council, it's, what is it, 19 members, I think. Uh, I don't know if that's with or without the, the permanent five, to be honest with you, but it's, you know, it's, it's a range of, of countries, of nation states from all over the world who are 
uh, deciding when we can use force and when we can't use force, what sort of uh, actions are, are justified to take in different circumstances. Uh, if we do look at the part, permanent five members, which I can name, the, the, other, the other members, right, are, are elected for, for terms, right, so they're, they're nation states, but they're, they're elected by the other nation states, right, to serve for, 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 for an amount of time. You'd have to check out the U UN website for the, for, the, for the more specific details on that, I suppose. Um, but then, but then there's the five, mem the five permanent members and the five permanent members, right, even they are not all Western, right, uh, although many of them are. Is it only China that's not? Maybe it's only China that's not. You, know, you wouldn't call China Western, that would really stretch the imagination, but uh, you know, you've got Russia on there, which uh, th there's oftentimes debates about whether they are part of the West or not, uh, whether they're European or not, but they might very well be European. Uh, France, fairly European. Uh, Britain, uh, the United States, right, which is you know, not in Europe. <laughs> Uh, still Western, no, absolutely. Um, uh, and I'm missing one more. Who, who, who have I left to last? Uh, we've got uh, France. Did I mention Britain yet? France, Britain, the United States, Russia, and China. Uh, I must have missed Britain out, who are also uh, fairly European. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, the permanent five, but, but, the, but we have China. And also the non-permanent members are oftentimes not. Uh, European countries, or many of them are not European countries. So um, that might be another way to to sort of challenge the question uh, a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a fair point to make and to, and to discuss and, and, and to think about. Next one, does international law have any real power if states just refuse that? Oh, that's the one we started with. And again, that's more next week. We'll, we'll, that, the whole of next week covers that question. So uh, definitely do the reading next week. The author makes a distinction between international law and as, oh, this is where I wanted to be. Uh, the, the author makes a distinction between international law as a law between states and a law above states. In our modern society, do we see more of the former or the latter? If between states, will we drift towards a law above states as the world becomes more interconnected? And I wonder, um, okay, so that last part is hinting at a world government, I think, which Neff also hints at, but he says, look, you know, maybe, this is uh, 155, so at the very end of that first long paragraph. Uh, if finally international law is understood to mean the enactments and judicial decisions of a world government, right, um, which there isn't one, then its birth lies, at least Neff doesn't think there is one, then its birth lies, if at all, right, doubts that it even maybe will, somewhere in the future and in all likelihood the distant future of that. Uh, so that that I understood that that well becoming more interconnected made me think of, of the world government, but you might not have been uh, referring to that. But Neff doesn't think there would be one, at least not for a long time. Um, but this distinction between law between states and law above states, it was, I saw another question on that. Let me see if I, bring, if I also check. Yeah, yeah, Neff explains that positivists say that international law must now be seen as a law between states and not as a law above states. How effective can a law be if it does not serve above those who are bound by it? So I want to cover both of those questions. Right now. Um, and I want to do it by saying, I think this is more of a concept, right? This reading is much more focused on this evolution of a concept of international law rather than the practice. The practice is what, we, what we're going to deal with next, next week. But the above, and, the above and, and between is interesting. And I think it's just really the, the distinction that we've already made between natural law that exists outside of states, beyond them. It's not their will. They haven't decided on that law. They're just subject to it. Uh, the same way that the, 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 the animals are subject to it, the same way that, that the water is subject, and the same way I think that the angels are subject to it. Right? It, it's just it's, it's, it's a universal law that subjects everything to it. You know, uh, everybody down here on Earth, in the Earth, I guess I'm imagining natural law sort of all around the Earth, I suppose, right? Uh, even though they might not have thought about it in the way that we think of it as a sphere, right? But, but I'm imagining it sort of a, a force above everything, right? Above the world. Uh, and that everything that's in the world is subject to that, to that law, right? And so then that, that's definitely above states. Uh, that's the above states that I think they're referring to. Not necessarily a world government. Uh, whereas a, a law between states 
is a law that states themselves are making with one another and that they're agreeing with one another. They're making treaties, right? That's part of what's going to form international law. They're making treaties with, with, with one another. They're forming institutions with those treaties like the UN, where they're sitting and deliberating on issues together as states. So it's the will, it really comes down to, is, is, is the will of a state involved? If, it, if the will of a state is involved, that's the law in between states. If, if the will of the state is not involved, if they're just only subject to a higher law, um, when you say higher law, of course, then, then we have to think of both states. That's the distinction that I think Neff is making, that, that he's pointing us to. Um, and of course, with that uh, sort of comes the idea right, that what states do is right, right? If a state decides to do something and if it, and if it agree, you know, even if it doesn't agree with another state, if, it, if, if it's a law between states, then it's a law about what states do. And what they do makes the law. If what's, that, that's really where I want to be. This is the, if what states do makes the law, then what states do makes the law, then, 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 then what they do is, is legal. In some ways it sounds uh, like it's a, a little bit of a joke, like a bit of a joke, but that's, that's really, I think, what, what positivism is doing, right? It, if what states do makes the law, then what, they, what, what states do is legal. There's a little bit of a pun, I think, but um, that's what I'm getting at. There's some sort of a pun there, but it's, it's also true, right? Um, whereas if, it's, if the law's above the states, right, if it's a natural law, then the states, what they do might be in contravention of that natural law. But you can't be in contravention of a law that you make, I think, uh, which, is, which is the big distinction. Again, that's the big distinction that I want to get to you. Uh, in international relations and in international law uh, between the, the natural law and the, and the positivism. But again, I think it answers this, this question in terms of the law between states and the law above states. Um, yeah. And then if we add on to that, right, we, we get to probably the cynical view of international law that, that we're, we'll address more next time, but the cynical view that, hey, well, you know, what's the use of it if states can do whatever they want anyway? Uh, I think that's a, maybe a result of positivism, right? where states make the laws. If they make the laws, then they make the laws. Uh, what are we going to say about them? Right? Uh, if there's nothing above them, uh, how why can we complain, right? And then, and then if we just, you know, uh, I don't know. I think I was going somewhere a little bit different with that, but but it's gone. Or maybe not different, but just a little bit further. But I don't know where now. And I want to, I want to, I think I've covered a lot, a, a lot of good stuff there. Uh, next week is going to be interesting. Right? We're really going to cover the sort of the, the effectiveness of international law on states. But I want to finish off with this one last question. It, it's not super, I don't think it's super applicable to international law, but it is definitely taken from the reading. So let's see what it says. It says on page 157. Here we are. Uh, it talks about how giving up your rights voluntarily is the only way to have security. That must be where they talk about Hobbes. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've seen the actual quote here. Uh, it's the only way to have security. But, they're, they're, but aren't there countless examples of people being secure without losing their rights? I, I wish it had popped a few uh, examples on there. That would have been uh, interesting. Let, let, let's read out uh, which part of the reading that we're referring to here. It's page 157. It's the second column and it's just before halfway. Right? It's closer to the top and the bottom. But uh, it says this. It says security could only be obtained, so, sorry, security could only be attained by the radical step of having all of the persons in a state of, of nature surrender their natural rights to a sovereign power of their own creation with the result that henceforth the only law which they would live under would be the law promulgated by that sovereign. Um, that's clearly, the, that's clearly the, uh, the connection to international law. Right? It's this breaking away from, from, from breaking ourselves away from natural law. This is one of the steps in that process that um, you know, still we have natural law because we have those two uh, two obligations that we talked about earlier on but you know the, we're sort of 
broke, we've sort of broken now with, with following the law of nature. Now the only law that we follow is, is the law of the sovereign, uh, which, which is actually that might even be the step, right? That might even be the step from, from natural law to, to, uh, to positive law, to positive law. Uh, give up your rights voluntarily is the only way to have security. Yeah. And so this isn't really about security, this uh, particular reading. So it's, it's hard really to answer that um, without losing their rights. And it depends what you mean by rights. I'd probably tackle this question in the following way. I would talk about the difference between sort of natural rights and civil rights. Uh, uh, civil rights has a different meaning than, than what, I, what I intended there. Uh, I mean rights within a civil society. Right? So in, in a country, you know, there's arguments of where do our rights come from? Um, but for Hobbes, they come from the sovereign. Uh, the law comes from the sovereign. That's all we, we, we follow, the, the sovereign the sovereign then. So, uh, yeah, sure, we have maybe the sovereign gives us some rights, sets us up some rights um, as part of the laws of the land that, that he makes. Um, but the security of be of of because what's, what Hobbes is trying to do, right? He's trying to get us out of this situation where everybody has a right to everything else. In nature, says Hobbes, we all have a right to everything, the whole world. We, we have a right to the whole world in the state of nature, says Hobbes. And so if somebody else has something that you want, then uh, we, we talked about this when we talked about Hobbes, when we take it, right? And so uh, there's no security in, in that situation, right? This, 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 this version of the law of nature. Um, and so we give it up. Uh, we give up the right to everything for uh, a, a more limited set of rights that are governed by a sovereign right, who also offers security in return. So that's where Hobbes, that, that's where Neff, that's what Neff's getting at here. Uh, I'd be interested to sort of continue this a little bit longer uh, if I had a few examples about, you know, what, how people are exercising their rights. You know, what sort of rights? Is it their natural rights? Uh, and then that might take us back to sort of this, uh, where we were a few minutes ago with the, hey, we can break laws, right? We live in a, in, 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 a, in a society where there is a sovereign, right? The, I don't know, the constitution or the, or the, or the, the, uh, you know, the government of the United States or something like that. There is that sovereign, you know, the laws are sovereign perhaps. Uh, there are those laws and we do live in that. And we have the security, uh, but maybe we could have said the natural rights that Hobbes talks about, right? By just taking whatever we want. Uh, and we could do that. Uh, and then when they come to arrest us, we could also um, invoke our natural rights of self-preservation right? and, and, and prevent ourselves from being arrested. Um, you know, we, we could sort of, uh, we could, I forgot the word, we could assert, that's what I mean. We could assert our natural rights, um, but, uh, the likely result of that is that we go to prison <laughs> and perhaps even the death penalty, right? Depending on how we prevent ourselves from being arrested. Uh, so, um, so, so, so there are some rights, at least according, at least for Hobbes, right? There are some rights that we are giving up. Um, you know, our right to liberty, our, our, you know, in the law of nature, for, in the state of nature for Hobbes, we all have a, you know, it's, a it's an unlimited, uh, right of freedom to, to move and do move around and uh, you know living in society we give up that right it, it's it's conditional right? we have a right to freedom conditioned on us obeying the laws uh, of the land so I think that's 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 definitely uh, where where Neff is going uh, with Hobbes so uh, I want to end it there that was a nice uh, sort of finish uh, I do commend this reading to you and I ask you uh, even to go back and, and sort of read through it again. It's, it's very detailed. I, like I said, I've read it twice this semester. I must have read it at least five times. You know, it's probably about five pages. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, there's, there's always something extra that you can take away from it. All right. And uh, I look forward to seeing your, your questions uh, for, the, for the, uh, the perspective questions.